Hi everyone. Who felt grateful this morning when they woke up? I did. This morning when I woke up. Not because I'm in LA, but because I'm alive. Okay, I'm gonna do one thing. I'm gonna remove my shoes. Okay. So this is the earliest picture of my uh, childhood. I'm the little clown over there, the little boy over there. Um, my brother and I, as in life, we had um, our back against the wall. The only way was to go forward. I was born in Rwanda, where I grew up. Um, I had a normal childhood. My uh, father was a pilot, and my mom worked for the government. And my dream growing up was to become a pilot like him. Um, I was crazy. I was just break bones all the time. And my father used to give me a stick because I used to be, you know, jumping over stuff. And then the stick was the only thing that really kept me calm. Fortunately, in 1994, when I was 13 years old, we had a genocide that claimed 800,000 lives. I was in boarding school, 143 miles away from home, and with other 437 students who were stuck in school. For over two months, we witnessed the genocide unfold uh, on campus. People running from machetes and women running with babies trying to place to hide. And the director was a, a clever person who um, we asked us to wear a uniform, and then we put us in the cafeteria of the school, and then all day we'd be looking at the windows, people running and banging at the door with machetes and, and, and try to get in, and, and asking people, asking the director, are you hiding people here? He would be like, no, we're hiding anyone, everybody's wearing a uniform, and then if you want to check, you're going to have to ask one person who that, who's not armed to come in and then check. And that's how most of the kids at school survived. I was lucky to be able to leave the school before and then join my family that were able to get out of Kigali, which is the capital, safely. And then we moved to the Democratic Republic of Congo. It was called year back then. Uh, where we lived, um, right on the edge here, um, from 1996 to, uh, to, from 1994 to 1996, a little town called Bukavu. And I went back to school, life was normal, I was having a good time. And then in 1996, the war again um, broke out, the Congolese war. And as, 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 as the war getting closer, my family started walking towards west. For six months, we walked. From here, all the way to the Republic of Congo, covering roughly 4,000 miles. It took us six months walk. At the beginning, it was a big group of people, but with time, people start dying. Um, there were corpses along the trail. Um, I was 16 then, and I was old enough to know what was happening. Um, we get burned by the sun at noon, in this area, this, this part of the, the Congo is the equatorial forest. So it's the deep, thick jungle. Um, basically, we walk in the mud up here. And you leave the mud, you get in the river up here. And sometimes to cross rivers, you have to cut a tree on one side, and then someone you have to swim on the other side and cut a tree. So the trees will fall into the water, and then you have to walk on the branches. I mean, I saw people, women, the babies on the back, falling to the river dying, um, and then halfway through the, through the walk, somewhere here, my brother and I, on this refugee camp, um, we got cholera. Um, it's a disease that takes all the water out of your body. In less than five hours, you, you become um, dehydrated, and then you start having cramps. So your arms start like themselves, the muscles cramp, so that you... You scream, they bring your arms back, and your head goes sideways, they can't bring it back. And, um, we spent four days in this hospital where every five minutes someone would die in front of you, next to you, and my brother and I sleeping, 
laying next to each other, we used to talk about how, who wants to go first. And, 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 but we luckily all survived. And along the way, we got attacked by red ants, scorpions, snakes. We slept in cemeteries. Um, we fought with the pygmies to get some food because most of the pygmies never seen people before. Um, we crossed the Congo River, which is the second largest river in the world, um, more than three times. So this is how people lived in the jungle. Uh, basically, you make a little shelter and then try to find food. And I was fortunate enough to get the permission of this French photographer, Jean-Claude um, Coutos, to use his photographs he took in the Congo. Um, so I saw my mom losing all the way, uh, and she was carrying my little brother, who was nine, nine months old. So my little brother got pneumonia, he got all the disease you can imagine, but my mom fought to keep the baby alive. So after the walk, we end up in the Republic of Congo on this small island where we're trapped between the Congo River and the swamp forest. So for eight months, I learned how to fish. I never fished in my life before. Uh, I learned how to fish, I learned how to paddle boat, like paddle standing on a canoe. I became an expert in swimming in the Congo River. Um, and then after that little island, we moved to Brazzaville. This is me at 17 years old. I borrowed this clothes because it was a special occasion. It was the day I, was, I got baptized. And this was a special day for me because this is the beginning of my journey to find forgiveness and to find peace with my past. Those are the kind of house people lived in. Basically, you cut the grass and then you build walls and, and, and you try to, to find a shelter. And then in Brazzaville, I was able to go back to school. This is my brother and I going back to school. For three years, I wore the same uniform, wrote in the same notebook. So every year, I would go back and then write in the same notebook for three years. We lived in that little house. It was a two-bedroom apartment for seven years. And after high school, I went, I went to college because through the work, when we were walking through the jungle, the radio was saying there is no more refugees on this part of the Congo. Even though planes were flying very low over our head, basically, we were doomed. We were forgotten and we were being killed randomly because in 2010, the UN published a report saying that what happened to us in that period, maybe because that's the cream of genocide. So I went back to school, got um, a degree in journalism because I felt I wanted to become a voice of those I couldn't speak. And then in 2004, the same year I graduated, we, as a family, resettled to Vermont through the High Commission of Refugee. It was the first time I ever left um, Brazzaville. I was very happy, very excited to be able to leave the mosquitoes and be able to leave the hardship. And I was like, yeah, I'm moving to America. Land in Vermont, and the next day, we had snow. <laughs> oh, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I never seen snow in my life before. Um, everything was white, the houses, the street, and the people. And then it was the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and for the first time of my life at 24, I realized I'm black. And that mean black was something bigger than the color of my skin. But through my journey, I have learned that the only way to survive the environment is to embrace it. And here's me snowboarding. I snowboard. I'm a big snowboarder. I love being in the mountains snowboarding. So after moving to Vermont, um, my first job was in my factory jobs. But my brother and I we had the dreams. We wanted to go back to school, get an education. So I went back to school. Graduated in 2010 with a public relations degree. Um, and right after graduation, in the fall, I took off. Drove across country from Vermont to LA. It was the first time of my life I ever made a decision to move away from my family, to move from one place to another without being forced to. I was 29. It was a very, very big moment of my life because I struggled for years to reconcile the fact I'd been um, oppressed um, and survived, but I couldn't find a way to um, understand that it's okay, you can make your own decisions. 
So the first trip I ever made was, every mile was a healing process for me. I can do this, I can do this. I only had $1,000 in my pocket. I was like, please don't, my car, don't fall apart. Um, and I did it. Um, it was great. And the, through that process, I fell in love with photography because photography allowed me to see the world in a new light. It allowed me to slow down and then to be able to capture something. And then through that, I was able to refine my, uh, my joy that I lost through the war. So this is a picture of my mom and my brother. My brother now, he's 17 years old. He's going to be a junior in high school. He's a big boy, he plays basketball, he plays football, he's, the quarterback of his, he's going to be the quarterback of his team. Um, and that's when I started documenting my family because it was a process of us adapting to a new culture and, and, and adapting to, to a new life that was very different to where I come from. Because the first thing I realized in America was moving from that fatalistic perspective of the world to a problem-solving perspective. How do you stop saying it's the will of God to say, how can I resolve this? And that was a big shift for me. Um, so through photography, I was able to capture the playfulness. And, and, and by capturing that, I was able to also gain that the joy I had as a little kid um, documenting people in my community because I believe that art holds an important part in my community because I believe the community without art is an invisible community. Um, so there is the immigrant that come to, uh, to Vermont and then try to adjust and then I got very interested into what makes us survive and then the resiliency of a human soul. We all go through different things but what makes us not break down? What makes us not giving up and then really thrive and then waking up every morning knowing it's going to be difficult? but you keep doing it. So at the beginning of the year, I went to India. It was a big move. But as soon as I landed in India, because I feel like in America I'm 100% African, in India I was 100% American. It was the first time I've ever seen myself that way, the way I think, the way I process. I lost it for three days, I didn't know what I was. Because people were, like, were addressing to me as an American, and I was like, no, 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 no. But I was, in fact, really have changed so much. And it was the first time I ever seen myself in that, in that light. I went to India to do a story on the Indians of African descent. There is a community called the Sidi that we brought over a long time ago by Portuguese as slaves and then they stayed. Um, so I was privileged to stay with them for 15 days and then just enjoy their lives in the sense they have adapted. and. and and accustomed to, to this culture. I love kids. Um, so through that, I came home, and then somehow I found the strength to go back home, because I felt like I would never, my life would never be complete until I go back home. So in February, I made my first trip back home after 18 years. This is the first time also I ever started writing on my pictures. So it says, when we force when we face our fears, we become free from hate. And that was a commitment to myself. I wanted to be fair, and I want to be true to my story, but the way, only way I could have done it is to go back home. So, when the plane was landing in Kigali, my heart almost stopped, because I was so fearful, and I was so afraid of what may happen to me. But I read a book called Surviving Survival. In this book, um, Lawrence uh, Gonzalez said that you have to overwrite bad experience of good ones. So for me, the only way to do so, I had to go back to the origin of my misery. And I went back home. It was a miracle to be able to work in a place I grew up. I left when I was 13, now I'm, I'm 32. So it was very um, interesting to go to the markets and, and, and see people and then walk in the neighborhood I grew up in. This is the house, actually, I lived in. And then, I went to see my family members. This is my, my cousins. Some of them, I never met them before. Um, but it was striking that, actually, we look alike. I never, because I was so, I had been gone for so long. And I was able to go to my uh, dad's uh, birthplace by accident, 
and then ask them if I could see the tomb because the last time I was there was to bury my grandfather. I was five years old. And I remember clearly, the first thing I asked them was, can I go see the tomb? So they took me behind the house, and here I was standing. It was a very profound moment because my dad passed away when I was seven, and I was the first person in my family to go back to that place. And I felt like who could have be, been proud for me to see me coming back to his hometown. After that, I went to see my grandmother I haven't seen in 16 years. The last time I saw her, I was a little boy. Um, it felt so amazing to be able to hold her in my arms and to be able to, uh, to cry and laugh with her. Um, she told me that now she can die because she had seen me. And then I was like, no, you're going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I have realized that forgiveness is a journey, not the destination. We have to thrive to seek for forgiveness and to forgive ourselves and to forgive others because I have learned through life that really forgiveness is not for them. It's, it's not for the people that hurt you, it's for yourself because that's the only way you can be free. Um, I love to end with this quote by Nelson Mandela. For to be free is not merely to cast off one chain, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. I believe that I am responsible for my neighbor. I'm responsible for my fellow countrymen because the only way we can be free is to preserve other people's freedom. And I'm inviting you to join, to join me on this journey, to seek for, to free other people around us because if by doing so, by freeing other people, we are truly freeing ourselves. Thank you very much.